Hello, everybody. Can you guys give me a quick uh, audio visual check uh, while I'm waiting to see that in the comments? I promise <laughs> this is not clickbait. This was like actually something that really happened, which we'll talk about. Uh, it's really it's really fun uh, running a small business. Some of the uh, stuff that's been we've been through in the last month has been super invigorating, but it like set me on the floor when I was like, wait a minute here, why aren't we doing better. Um, so with that note, it's three o'clock. Let's get this started. Um, I'm going to try to monitor the comments as best I can. I think Julie's in here as well. Um, so if you have questions, uh, by all means, shoot them there. Uh, and if I don't get to them, post, throw them back up toward the end. Um, so this is a story of why aren't we making any money? Let me switch my screens here. So literally what happened was we had a pretty good month earlier this year. And I sort of think about this on a daily basis of um, what is, what are we selling? What's going out the door? And it just bothered me when I looked at this income statement at the end of the month. And I thought, well, wait a minute here, our profit and loss, our income statement doesn't really look as good as I thought it should. Uh, and our, our checking account didn't really change either. So that's kind of what made me think, look, let's dive into this. Um, this all relates back to Saunders Machine Works. So we're, I think, a pretty a much a quintessential uh, brick and mortar business. We buy raw material. We, let me see here if I can get YouTube back up here. Um, we buy raw material, like we machine it into fixture plates, the mod vices, accessories. Uh, we buy other stuff that we just resell, screws, fasteners that go into it. Um, we buy packaging boxes and we ship it out to folks all over the world. Kind of world, kind of business 101. Um, so the one thing that is a preface to all this that I think is kind of funny is a piece of advice from my second boss, uh, somebody who was really influential uh, and I look up to to this day. Um, and he was joking, when you're doing budgets, forecasts, modeling, estimates, pro formas, whatever you want to call it, um, this idea of, you know, bill of materials, cost of goods sold, there's one thing that's true is that's going to be incorrect. Um, kind of a tongue in cheek saying, but they're just that, they're just estimates. Um, and what I wanna to talk to today is, do we have a product issue? Are we not making enough margin? Uh, or do we have a business issue more relating to the overhead or your overall uh, business? Product stuff is your margin, simple as that. You buy all your materials, your cost of goods sold, and you sell it for enough that needs to make enough money to cover all your business overhead type stuff. For us, like many businesses, the big expenses are going to be payroll and rent. Um, but you've got repairs and maintenance. Those can be kind of lumpy. Uh, you've got buying equipment. We, I think if you're on this uh, live stream, you probably like CNC machines. They're not cheap. Uh, and there's lots of other accessories and preparatory purchases that can go along with it. Um, other lumpy expenses we'll get into uh, and uh, accounts receivable. So that's another good one that talks about the differences between cash flow and actual uh, profitability and accounting terminology. So this is literally how I think, and it's, and it's kind of wrong. I think, okay, we sell a product for, these are kind of fictitious numbers, but they're not too far off. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, we sell a product for $500 we buy the raw material for $125. That's the biggest expense. It gets anodized. And there's a couple other little things that go along with it, screws and so forth. $333 contribution margin. So the idea is that that's the amount of money that goes toward covering your overhead. And obviously you hope there's some left over at the end of the day, month or year uh, that goes towards your kind of business profitability. $333. So that's wrong. Um, now, the example on the right is a little bit overdone. It's kind of the extreme version of what it could be taken to. But the point is, um, there's one thing that's true. Switch back over here. You're not really ever going to make more than $500 on selling a product for $500. It's just kind of sort of not possible. What is true is there's going to be a bunch of other things that are pulling at that, that are either adding to your cost of goods sold or other sorts of expenses. So in this example on the right side, for right off the top, we've got a credit card fee. Um, you can argue about whether that's part of the 
cost of goods sold or whether it's a business expense, but it's it's real and it's variable related to the product. So I think it's good to have it in the cost of goods sold. Um, everybody's aware of how much uh, raw material has changed recently. And, and so, you know, we're not able to always update our cost of goods sold or bill of materials every day. Uh, so there's a good chance that your prices have gone up and they're not necessarily correct anymore in your Excel file or your Google Sheets or so forth. Um, anodizing hasn't changed, but one of the things that we realized is it costs us a fair amount of money to send um, our stuff to and from anodizing. In fact, probably about $200 to get a pallet there and back. And we send a lot of times maybe eight plates on a crate. So 200 bucks divided by eight means we're spending about $25 per uh, pallet or per, per plate to get it just to and from anodizing. Adding to that, T-nuts costs went up. And not only did T-nut costs go up, but um, we have to spend money shipping those T-nuts and screws from the vendor to us. Now, again, we're getting nitpicky here, but those costs, um, they add up. They add up in the sense of when I looked at our income statement at the end of the month, and I was kind of like, why isn't it better? Well, it's because you spend a bunch of money shipping stuff to and from you and other vendors. Uh, we have a custom boxes for most of our bigger products. Um, we have a lot of times buying or using pallets and wood. We recycle, reuse stuff where we can, but we're still buying those. Um, some VCI, like a rust preventative paper. Bubble wrap, fun fact, bubble wrap, actually super expensive as a packaging material. Um, you know, we're usually buying stuff from Uline now in pretty large quantities. So again, that really adds up. Um, that all does a pretty uh, massive change to your contribution margin. It was 67%. Uh, and it dropped down to below fifty percent. Uh, um, the dollar amounts are still kind of sort of okay, in my opinion. You know, kind of around that fifty percent margin number. Uh, but the other thing to think about is what do you? Ha how do you handle broken parts, uh, scrap parts, broken tools, etc.? This especially ties into the job shop world, where um, it's a little bit more sensitive to buying one-off tools or. Uh, lower volumes where you can really lose your shirt. Um, and of course, I don't have the right answer for everybody in every scenario, but what I do know is that if we buy 100 pieces of material throughout the year, pretty low odds that that's gonna always be 100 pieces of material sold for whatever reason. We may use one for R&D, we may use one for internal fixture plate, we may use one uh, that gets scrapped, <laughs> the shipping company may use one. There's all sorts of scenarios um, but again, my point isn't so much to spend a lot of time coming up with a number here, but rather those things add up, uh, add up, and end up kind of eating at your bottom line. Um, but the big, uh, the big cut to this is the is the text down here at the bottom. If you end up working with a distributor, they're going to want their cut. Uh, a pretty normal cut would be 25 to 40 percent. And what's brutal about that is that that cut um, kind of comes off the top, so it's not. Uh, related to the expenses, but it's 35% off the revenue line. And if, in this case, on this product, if we offered a 35% cut to a distributor, it would take the $333 contribution margin in my like kind of mental scenario and drive it down to $64 or 13%. And uh, I have friends who have kind of had troubles with businesses, and I've heard other case studies and anecdotes that this is what um, this is what kills you. This is what will put you out of business, period. Just not making enough money. Um, beyond that, there's some hidden costs that we kind of came through this month when we were looking through all of this. Um, there was a kind of crummy, uh, oh, so credit card fees, we already talked about that. They're not really hidden, but they really do add up. Um, the other one is the credit card companies, Stripe and PayPal, have decided, I think as of last year, to no longer refund uh, canceled orders. And, you know, there's nothing we can do about this, so at least as far as I know, so there's no reason to get too upset about it per se, but it's a big deal because if somebody places a um, $1,000 order, that's probably $30 in credit card fees at least actually. If they then cancel that order, for whatever reason, they actually cancel it because they just want to tweak it or they cancel it because they don't want it anymore. Um, we don't get that $30 back. And historically, until again, about last year, um, you were refunded that amount. The other things that we've been kind of fighting with or dealing with are shipping. So 
like any like many folks using Shopify, we have a pretty decent shipping integration through uh, both Shopify and third-party apps. Where we get bit or where we've found some issues is um, the parcel companies, the FedEx and UPSs, will often quote you one rate, but then they'll charge you something different. Um, and you can argue about, frankly, whether that's ethical. So a lot of it's in the fine print. But the things that matter, if you have anything that doesn't let them have a package be run through their machines, like strapping or loose stuff, or it's not in a perfect cardboard box, they'll charge you a pretty hefty processing fee. Um, there's a thing called dimensional weight. If you're a shipper, um, take a look into what dimensional weight is. It's, it's basically the uh, cubic volume times the weight divided by a number that tells you how they actually bill it. Um, in any pa packages that are over 50 pounds now, they are usually adding surcharges onto. Again, the issue there isn't just the cost of the shipping. It's a question of whether your shipping software is quoting one rate, but you're getting charged a different rate. Similarly, we ship a lot of stuff via LTL freight, um, and there's a lot of hidden fees and stuff in the freight industry. It's a, it's a bit of a rough industry, um, but we get charged for if we only have one pickup, and we get charged big time for residential and lift gate. Um, again, the issue is sometimes they don't quote it that way, so the customer pays a low rate, but then it ends up being a residence, or the customer says, oh, you know what, I need a lift gate, and uh, we then get charged for that. Okay, switching over though to timing issues. This is a, a huge part of why at the end of the month when I thought we were doing certain a certain tier and I look at the bank account and it's just not there. Uh, the, the most basic part of this is accrual versus cash accounting. So if we sell a plate in September uh, to a, cu a customer that's paying via PO, they have net 30, net 60, uh, sometimes even longer. You don't get paid till November. Um, most accounting softwares are going to book that on an accrual basis, meaning if you sell it in September, you earn the revenue in September, but your bank account isn't going to show that. If you don't aren't familiar with that, we have a link later in this video and in the YouTube description for just very basic accounting terminology and accounting uh, practices for manufacturing entrepreneurs. I would highly encourage you to get a little bit more comfortable. It's incredibly valuable to understand how that stuff works. Um, the other thing on timing issue is raw material. Um, as our business has grown, we want to balance that line of having enough material on hand to not get caught with our pants down, uh, but I don't want to over invest in raw material. I, it's expensive to store it if you ever change your product rev, uh, and the, ultimately I, I can't have that much money tied up in it. But with COVID and kind of this craziness of the last 18 months, um, we've seen material delays, material shortages, material price changes. Um, I'd rather pay a little bit more for material and know I have it in my shop than have a bunch of CNC machines that don't have anything to eat. So we've been buying more raw material, uh, which is great too, because our business is growing, uh, but that means we have money tied up in raw material that's not in our checking account. Uh, for us, payroll is a pretty large percentage of what I keep in our checking account. And all I mean there with the timing issue is that if it happens to be that payroll was run right toward the end of the month, that's going to take a chunk out of the checking account that kind of wouldn't have been there if payroll had been run uh, 10 days earlier, if that makes sense. Um, capital purchases. If you buy anything that is capitalized or a big CNC machine or, you know, your thresholds kind of depend on what you and your accountant or your tax guidance say, but certainly anything over thousands of dollars, you don't get to just expense that right away. You have to um, depreciate that. So take an example. We just bought an Okuma. We wrote a down payment check for that Okuma, uh, and that number doesn't show up on our income statement. It definitely comes out of our checking account, but it doesn't show up on our income statement because for us, we, I do all our bookkeeping, if you will, but we have an accountant. I will get with him probably at the end of the year and he'll come up with a depreciation schedule for that machine. And the depreciation entry will get added. Uh, and that's a kind of a non-cash expense. Um, so it'll reduce your net income, but not by that much uh, because you have to depreciate these machines over their lifetime. Um, but what is real is the down payment I just sent. So that's actually one of the big reasons why we had a good month and I was surprised to see that our bank account wasn't in better shape, but 
it was kind of okay because I'd actually written a check for a machine that we were going to have some equity in, uh, but it's not reflected on the income statement yet. And I mentioned lumpy expenses. Uh, this is simple. Stuff like our uh, business insurance, our workers' compensation, and property taxes, those are the ones that came to mind. Those are all kind of four-figure, you know, $1,000 plus expenses that get billed once a year. And, uh, you know, I enjoy doing some of the um, cash flow planning and forecasting. I like looking at Excel, but I'm not going through and creating 12-month increment intervals to smooth those out. But it's uh, nevertheless worth noting and thinking about. So if you are in the same boat, if you're a manufacturing entrepreneur, uh, my advice or what I'm thinking about uh, for our fixture plates, our mod devices, is if this is a problem, is it a product issue or is it a business issue? So business issues can be fixed. That means what if you just, you got too much, uh, you bought too much uh, or renting too much space and you need to readjust how much space your or your rent is. Uh, you got too many machine payments and uh, you just kind of businesses change or slow down and you need to get rid of some of those uh, or you've got too much staff. These are all, they can be complicated issues, but they can be solved. Um, and sometimes you got to take your um, entrepreneur hat off, take a step back and just take a look back and say, okay, how, what do I need to do to fix this? Especially if things get uh, tight. Product issues cannot be fixed. And this is important. If you aren't making enough money, uh, the distributor example before where it drove that margin down to, what was it, 13%, that's a real issue. You cannot fix that. And if there's one thing I've seen, it's it's folks that are passionate about bringing a product to market. They're passionate about trying to get into business, and they just don't have enough margin out the door, period. Um, the other things are worth adding, if even if you aren't thinking uh, about using a distributor, we don't. We generally sell most of our Saunders Machine Works stuff either direct via POs or through e-commerce. What are you going to do when a distributor calls you up and says, hey, or a retail store calls you up and says, hey, I want to buy 10 of your plates for this customer, or we want to put 100 of your flashlights in our retail store? Um, I wasn't until that happened to us with the 10 order that I realized, oh, man, I definitely want that business, but can I afford it? Um, so even if you aren't planning on leveraging retailer or distributors as part of your business model, uh, be prepared for it. Similarly, there's all sorts of examples of sales, discounts, promotions, Black Friday, et cetera, that are going to be sort of these events that cut into your top line revenue. Accounts receivable. So basically, if you sell that plate in September and you aren't going to get paid until November, um, that's an account receivable. This is the whole net 30, net 60, net 90 uh, lots of people um, really hate this, and for good reason. It stinks. Um, we've, you guys have heard of this, of companies that really want to string you out. Um, it stinks. My advice is you got to communicate. you got to stay on to it. Agree up front on the terms and then hold your customer to those terms. Um, that can be difficult to do. We have a whole video, uh, link in the description, on how to get paid on time. Um, in we have never been stiffed, knock on wood, and we sent a, we had our lawyer send a one customer ever we had to send a letter to on a legal letterhead, and the payment was made the next day. So I don't have all the answers in the world, but we've been through the block on this, um, and it matters. And one of the reasons it matters is 82% of business failures are due to poor cash flow management. If you look at that, that is not profitability. That is not product margin. That is a business issue. That is the fact that you can sell a lot of products, but if your customers aren't paying you, you can't pay your employees, you can't pay your rent in accounts receivable. You need cash. Um, it's a good segue to a video I'm working on uh, for in probably the next month or so, um, kind of thinking about preparing for a slowdown or a downturn, um, which kind of seems counterintuitive. The world's been a pretty good place given all this COVID insanity, but um, I always like trying to be a little contrarian and thinking about, you know, what's going to happen if things slow down or when things slow down uh, or a rainy day and, and kind of being prepared for that. Somebody just asked, I think, does Saunders Machine Works have terms? I don't think we explicitly say that on our website, Vision Forge, but we have, we do offer them um, to anybody who reaches out to us directly and frankly, maybe something we need to do a better job of communicating uh, to. 
So I just mentioned this um, about cash matters and, and it ties back into exactly how long statistically companies survive. Um, but again, the point here is it has a lot more to do with cash flow management than it does just whether you're making money or not. So what I do um, and what kind of prompted this, this uh, event when I was like, wait a minute, what's going on is um, I've been doing a monthly report at the end of each month where I um, export our Excel income state, or I export our income statement into Excel, and I kind of just look through it. Uh, I think it's really important to do that as um, not when you've just been doing all your numbers, to kind of take a fresh look at it. And I will now make adjustments. So some of the adjustments that I've made kind of below net income was, hey, look, we ordered a bunch of extra material. That's kind of an asset. I've got that sitting on the shelf. It wasn't really fair to penalize July because I bought $4,000 extra of aluminum because I just wanted to have it on hand. Um, I also paid a higher price. Uh, we had this discussion. I huddled down with Ed and Grant. And I said, man, these material prices went up 30%. But what scares me is our um, one of our vendors said that they weren't going to get more material for four months. Uh, I've never heard that before. This is material that they normally have the next day. So I thought, again, I'm going to pay more and just get it here to make sure we can still stay in business. Um, if you guys, folks have seen, we're building Johnny Five Robot. It's fun. I love it. Um, it's not really fair to uh, take into account the costs involved in building Johnny Five from Saunders Machine Works bottom line. Um, so I'll usually make an adjustment on something like that. Like, hey, we just bought a $300 motor controller. Um, add that back in, in the adjustment area. Similarly, travel. I mean, if it's legitimate business travel, by all means, but sometimes if it's for us, like when we go do film tours, um, if it's something that, you know, I wanted to do, but it's not really, again, fair to give you an accurate look at how Saunders is doing, make an adjustment there. Um, you know, high-end cutting tool, a 3D printer, you know, these are all legitimate business expenses, but uh, they don't necessarily show you what the run rate looks like. So the comment at the bottom of this really matters. It's you can't ignore these non-recurring expenses because you're going to always have some non-recurring expenses, um, but don't necessarily judge your overall business health by them. Um, so just be careful that you're not always making exceptions, but I do think it matters a lot to, to look through them to get an idea of where you are at the end of the month. Um, switching now into a little bit more kind of philosophical stuff that ties into uh, hopefully an inside look at, at our, my life and our life here as a manufacturing entrepreneur. You know, we've had a lot of great days and I love it. Um, but one question is, if you had a good month or you had a bad month, were you busy? If you had a bad month but you didn't have enough work going on, um, maybe you want to hustle a little bit more. Um, we've had some friends do zometry work, which I think part of their model is you don't always have to do it, but if you have spindle time, you can go leverage that to pick up side jobs. I did that for seven years. We did job shop work on our free time. It was frankly a great way to learn how to be a machinist and kind of make some money, get paid to do it. Um, and I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore because we're focused on this business. But man, to me, that was part of the dream of being a small business owner and getting us to where we were. Um, if you are too busy, um, this is probably the most common thing I see, and I don't have all the answers, but, um, you know, lots of entrepreneurs, uh, work too hard and I admire that because I think that's part of getting to success, but it's not always sustainable and it kind of does yourself a disservice because eventually if you do want to break through and start hiring employees or start building out processes or a team, uh, the sooner you can start thinking that way, the better off you'll be, um, Hiring somebody isn't something you can always afford to do or logistically do, especially if you're, say, working in your house or your garage. So um, Upwork is a huge resource, um, or even interns. Uh, if you're in your garage, consider, is there any way to even have a remote intern? Um, again, may not work for everybody, but something to think about. Uh, and finally, um, just kind of a candid share, you know, at the end of that month when I was like, man, why didn't we make more money? I thought we were doing better. Um, it got me down for a second, and then I realized, wait a minute here, John, I love what I'm doing. And we didn't have as profitable a month as I want, but um, I'm still paying everyone on our team. We're covering our bills and I'm paying myself. And okay, so what? I love what I do. That doesn't necessarily mean I want that to be the case forever, but um, be real careful about whether you're going to let yourself get depressed or upset or sad or feel um, like you're not succeeding just because of that sort of a blip. Um, and a good segue to... Um, 
a solopreneur mentality. So when you're just starting out and it's just you, it's really hard to think about how your business is doing separate from your personal situation. Um, but as things grow, that really changes. Um, you know, we have six or seven employees here, quite a few interns. I really go out of my way to think about Saunders Machine Works as a different thing than my personal stuff. Um, and on that note, basically your business checking account has no bearing on your success. And I think John and Grimsman, I've talked about this some on our podcast, uh, it's really easy to look at that account and think whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And I just can't emphasize this enough. Um, in the beginning, if you're just you and your bank account basically just means um, that's how you're doing. I get that. And that's how we were for years. But again, at this point, we may have just bought a bunch of material. We may have just done payroll. We may have just put a deposit on the machine. Um, I really have detached myself from, from paying attention to what that business checking account balance means. And finally, I think we're wrapping up here. Um, why are you budgeting? Whether you want to call it budgeting or forecasting or so forth. Um, I do this for different reasons. Um, First off, from a kind of basic standpoint, you do want to make sure you're making money. Make sure this your business isn't an expensive hobby. Um, but sometimes I'm looking forward, so I'm trying to figure out, hey, I really want to be able to buy a new machine. How am I going to get there? Um, sometimes it's just saving for personal goals. So, so sort of how much can I take out of the business to help me justify what I'm doing? Um, and then finally, are you just trying to do it to build a cash cushion for your business? So kind of different reasons to think about, you know, if it's a if it's a bad month in terms of I didn't meet my goal but we were still have a cash cushion that's good and it means maybe you aren't going to get there quite as soon to buy that new machine but okay I can start thinking about where I want to do and how I want to get there and finally I've revisited this list a number of times it is wonderful um, all these bullet points I think are actually great bullet points the one I really want to uh, focus on is number ten here though and it says. Um, there will be sacrifices. Work to find a balance in your business so that you don't become a financially successful loser. It's not about the income, it's about the outcome. I love what I get to do, I'm super grateful. Um, whether it's building this business, running the shop, <laughs> machining parts, doing YouTube videos, touring other factories. Um, there are days where you wish you made more money, there's days where you do okay, but ultimately the outcome is so much richer than just that number. Um, I've got links below to these two videos. Uh, again, the first one is Accounting, a Beginner's Guide for manufacturers, Manufacturer, Entrepreneurs, and Machinists. And then the other one was the one I mentioned about how to get paid on time. Um, and again, we're working on a video of preparing for a slowdown, preparing for a downturn, because I think it's, um, it's my opinion that uh, it's been a really good 10, 12 year run. And if you look historically at uh, our economy and most economies, um, they're cyclical. And uh, I think that sometimes downturns come when you're least expecting them. And when COVID hit, I think we were all expecting a downturn. It never happened. Um, I can't predict when it's gonna happen. I will be ready though. So I'm gonna uh, hop back over to see if I can see the comments now. Um, thank you everybody though. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I'm catching up right here. Um, sorry, my lights just turned off. Um, Okay, questions. Let me get that working here. Made from the mind. Would love a quick word on deciding how much resources an appropriate bet to place on developing a new product or otherwise pursuing some other new development. Um, okay, I actually love this question. Um, and I have what I think is a great answer. Find a way to make some money. Uh, for us, when, back when I first got started, it was Strike Mark. We were making these Picatinny camera mounts. We made them. We made money on them, and we knew they sold. We then were willing to not pay ourselves that much, and so we took all of the profits from that and rolled that into R&D um, and didn't really care if uh, it succeeded or didn't. We, of course we cared, but uh, we weren't playing with our money anymore in a, in a sense. Um, and the lesson I learned there, we were trying to develop this... Uh, Sorry, my camera, my uh, camera showed up there for a second. We were trying to develop a um, rifle target, and that that is a very difficult thing to do, and we expensive thing to do. And what I realized, the lesson learned, was to develop the simple product first that can help make you some money. Let's see if this is working again, um, and then you can go spend all your. Um, sorry, get this fixed. 
you can spend that profitability to to flow into <laughs> into the R and D stuff. Hope that is what you're looking for. Made uh, made from the mind. Uh, material costs are killer this year. Yeah, and so that's a good question, uh, DMB Works. You know, at what point do we change our prices and do we start kind of passing that stuff uh, along? Um, it, it will be inevitable if this keeps up. Um, I'm kind of waiting to see what we see elsewhere. Parker Engines asks, have you thought about stockpiling a huge amount of material to prepare for increasing prices? No, because ultimately if, you know, if aluminum doubles, everyone will have to kind of be in that situation. So I don't worry as much because, you know, a fixture plate competitor is going to kind of be buying the same in the same situation. Um, kind of a tangential anecdote um, in the airline industry. I think Southwest was known for buying oil futures or, or contracts or hedges or whatever. And when oil prices went crazy in a certain decade, I don't remember which one, they were the only airline that had kind of locked in their oil prices with these complicated financial um, contracts. Now, a company like us, we, we can't buy metal futures like that. We're too small. Um, big companies certainly could. So there are tools at hand to look at that. Um, let's see here. A couple of questions from Omid. Q1, perhaps a video about transferring from job shop to product specific. Yeah, shoot me a follow up comment or note. I mean, we did that kind of gradually. In fact, I would guess if you asked our employees, I probably was reluctant to um, slow, I should have slowed down the job shop work quicker. Um, I kind of chuckled because look, I am not a great machinist. I can machine a great part, but like I always kind of joke, like I'm not God's gift to machine. I love it. Um, but we had a couple of job shop customers who were really upset when we told them we were going to stop doing it. And look, I'll take it as a compliment. We got them great parts at a reasonable price on time. We were great to work with. And they were like, we don't want you to stop this. We want to keep working with you. So if you're out there as a job shop, take that as kind of the it's not always that hard to succeed. Treat people well, communicate, do, do, do your work on time, uh, be a stand up person and the future will be kind to you. Lowry Racing asks, what are your thoughts about investing in insourcing processes? What kind of ROI do you look for? Um, so it's a great question. The obvious answer is um, if you have the capital and space and so forth, um, it's great to vertically integrate, but um, some things like anodizing are almost impossible to do. So think about how much hassle factor, how critical it is. Um, oh, I had a point on this though that really mattered. Um, oh shoot, I lost my train of thought on that. Um, make sure you, if you do that, you still need to kind of pay yourself if that makes sense. So the, another fatal flaw I see from a product level is people think, well, if I bring that in-house, I can reduce my prices. Well, not really because if you buy a $100,000 machine, a lapping machine, an anodizing solution, setup, grinding machine, you, you really should make sure you're earning some amount of return uh, on that. What we've seen, I think like anybody this year though, is that um, being able to control quality and lead times means insourcing uh, can really, really help there. Max says, Okuma machine question mark, which I'm guessing means you bought an Okuma machine. We sure did. Uh, we mentioned it on the podcast. Uh, we bought a Genos M660. It should be here in approximately 22 days and five hours or so. We are excited. Um, let's see here. Uh, where am I at here? This is insanely good advice. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Mason. I appreciate that. Um, no questions today. Just wanted to say I'm extremely happy with my plate. Thank you. Didn't mean to read that comment. Um, hi, John. What about engineering time? How to calculate pro a product? If you need to wait, create a new product, even small. We don't know how long it will be. Um, so you got to figure that out. Um, my goal, advice is if it's a lot of time, but you're confident you can execute on it, then um, you can put a kind of number on how much you need to make for that. Um, again, to go back to my example, when we tried to bring that uh, rifle target to market, it had circuit boards and water jet parts and laser uh, parts and electromechanical parts. And I didn't know anything about any of those things. And so not only was it comp, uh, not only was it complicated, but I wasn't the right person to do it. So I have no problem investing a bunch of time. But if you can make a 
a widget. Um, you know, I joke with some of my friends about, hey, what's the sweet spot? Is it a $50 machined part, $100 machined part? And you can start making a thousand bucks a month, 2000 bucks a month shipping that widget. Boy, it's a big confidence booster. Uh, you also learn a lot about business, about buying that material, processes, packaging, warranties, shipping. Uh, and while you're doing that, you can kind of parallel process developing the long tail um, product, or you can do that while you're still at a day job. Uh, Dan asks, is Zometry a good backup secondary source of income? Um, we've, we, to be honest, we've seen mixed reviews, but I've seen enough people I know that are doing well with it um, that it's certainly noteworthy. If it's not for you, then pass. But I think it's the key. Uh, the key is uh, they don't make you do anything to uh, like you don't have to pay to become uh, you have to go through a process, but you don't have to pay. I think there are some other companies in the past that I think were a little bit sketchy on that. Um, so if you want, if you have extra spindle time or you want to earn some more money, um, it's probably worth taking a look at. Full disclosure, they they have bought a ad on our NYC CNC site in the past, um, and I've gotten to know them. Um, but again, we've got a number of people that are doing a lot of work with them and are doing it. And they're also doing some pretty cool stuff, supplier side stuff. Uh, they have some new financial tools that I think are pretty interesting, um, but we'll cover that later if it's appropriate. Um, let's see here. Thanks for this weekly discussion. Thank you, Cavemans. ST21, oh. It's hard to follow these comments, guys. Sorry, I feel like I'm out of the loop on some of these conversations. Um, love your videos. I'm 26 year old trying to start my own business. I recently bought a Tormach. Is it a good machine to start making money? Any advice? So, the answer I give uh, is usually it's a question of like, should I buy a Tormach or a Haas? If you have to ask, generally I'm going to say buy a Tormach simply because you, if you're asking, you don't necessarily know, and you can sell a Tormach if you outgrow it or it's not the right machine for very little lost compared to our first Haas, the rigging alone, like our freight and rigging was $4,500. Um, so um, Tormachs have their limitations, as do, frankly, Haas machines. Focus on what you need to make the parts you need to make and start learning, get smarter on it, and then you'll figure out what the right machine is to buy there. Umax says, Okuma is wonderful, one of the best in the world. Never use the control, but looking forward to seeing your videos. Trust me, you won't have any reliability issues. Yeah, so. Uh, we bought it because we needed a bridge mill, uh, and the Genos is effectively a bridge mill design. But the more we've learned about OSP, uh, their control, which has some pretty cool open architecture to integrate with their API, we're going to try to integrate it with Lex, which, holy cow, that could be cool. Um, I said COVID killed lean. Did you ever think about giving your metal supplier an order for six to 12 months of material, but you only take material when you need it? I've heard of people doing that. Um, I've never tried. Um, and it's a, actually a good segue to a question of what are you trying to get at? I, I have fallen victim of the rabbit hole before of, oh man, I'm going to go find these screws that we've been buying from McMaster. I'm going to find this supplier in Nebraska that sells them for cheaper and I'm gonna open a credit account with them and I'm gonna buy 10,000 screws and then you realize, wait a minute here, you're gonna save like $200 or of course of the whole year. Just keep buying them from McMaster. They show up the next day when you need them. Um, so make sure if you're gonna go through stuff that you look at what it's actually gonna to do to your bottom line. Um, um, into Bun Gamer, I want to start a CNC business in my parents' garage with my own money, but they don't want to give me the place for a machine i don't know that's between you and your parents um uh get as small as machine as you can i guess the question is they don't want to give you a place is that because they don't believe in your business and maybe you got to demonstrate you are going to be able to do this um, i had some skepticism from my loved ones and i was going to maker spaces i was teaching myself this stuff and then i kind of earned their trust um, or maybe you have some issues on physical space which can be an issue um, and so forth. So um, see if there's another place where you can get the machine, a maker space, or they make small machines now that are enclosed, so put it in your room. And is investment in additive manufacturer too early for now? I mean, that's a too broad of a question. We're, we love 3D printing, we use it, but it's very different than machining. Uh, Zap, Zach asks, hypothetical, when you were doing a lot of job shop work, if a smaller shop was to approach you and ask to partner up and share jobs that were too big small, would you have accepted? Uh, sure. There's nothing like uh, that's a deal breaker to start that conversation. 
Um, I always kind of ask myself, why are they coming to me? Um, you know, is it is it something where you can overthink it? Look, and I'm prone to, to, to overthinking it or analyzing it. But yeah, you basically treat yourself as a sub to them. That's not a big deal. Uh, where I generally had a lot more concern or caution is kind of contract manufacturing for somebody else's product because if I'm doing chop shop work, that's fine. But if I'm going to invest my time into helping develop something, I kind of want to be part of the upside. And most of the time, if somebody's like, hey, um, I want to do this together, they really want all the upside. And I don't blame them, but I wasn't always interested in that. Uh, so, okay, so Rich asks, the ST20Y would be great, but it's expensive. Would you stick with non-live tooling and use a C-axis on a small mill or bite the bullet on a big lathe? Look, we love our ST20Y. Um, we, I would have, I understand that I could be helpful to have a simple two-axis lathe, and we have the little Tormach 8L now. It's great for, like, fixtures, little one-off pins and stuff. I love that, but, man, that Haas, I wouldn't want it any other way. Uh, driven tooling, Y-axis, and a sub-spindle, um, yes. Wes asks, did we ever finish Johnny 5? So of the, I'm going to round here, round numbers, of the 4,000 parts, like 3,900 are done. Like a huge number of them are done. Uh, we are assembling him. We've put some pictures up on Instagram. Um, to be honest, I don't know how to turn this into a video content at this point. Um, we've got an intern from a local high school team who's been crushing it, having a great job. So most of it at this point is some finishing, some, some fitment, a few less, a few more parts and so forth. Um, Intabun says they don't believe in me. Physical is less. So convince them, um, go get smart, go make parts, show them that passion. Um, I, I don't know your parents. Um, and I could see why you could fee uh, anybody could be upset that their parents don't believe in them, but um, to be blunt, I, I kind of was in that situation too. And then all of a sudden I started doing stuff and making parts and proving it out. And uh, I'm glad that I went that route because I really earned it. Um, okay, a couple more questions and I'm going to wrap up. Okay, motive tools. We can hire another employee and schedule a third shift or buy another machine to get more spindle time. How to think about that? Um, adding a third shift is usually pretty difficult. Um, I would probably look at a machine because there's a lot of things I can do with that. And if it doesn't work out, um, I can sell the machine, make it to use it to do something else, pick up different work for it. Um, a, lot easier, a lot easier in some respects. On the flip side, if you've got somebody you know who's a great machinist and wants to work that third shift, um, run with it. But we've heard most people we've talked to say, man, third shift is really tough to manage, to QC, um, et cetera. I've learned supply chains are weak twice over the past two years. We've been unable to get supplies. Um, have you a plan in place if you need to shut down temporarily, asks Andrew. So I don't have like a formal plan, but we don't plan to. Um, we have material on hand and uh, I have a cash cushion, which is hugely important, I think. So um, if we had to shut down temporarily because you know the government mandates it because of uh, COVID or something again, uh, I suppose, but I don't plan on shutting down because we can't get the material we need. Um, Todd says, I started a job shop, purchased the tools, but ended up going different machine. Now I'm probably selling. So the most started. Uh, talk to a machinery broker. Make sure you're asking a fair price. I mean, look, the hard answer is that some people want more than a machine than it's worth, but ultimately it's worth what you can find somebody to pay for it. NYC, how do you track talent? Um, YouTube is huge. Are you paying competitively? Uh, I'd like to think so. I obviously don't have all the answers. Wages are regional specific. Um, most of our employees are local. We actually haven't really ever had somebody come work here who just found us through YouTube like and moved here or whatever. Um, as we've changed a lot as a business, it's exciting to be in a position where I love our team and um, I love making sure they get compensated for being part of this story. Uh, look, money is a huge part of it. I my buddy, John at Area 419, I think is a great example. When they publish their job offerings, it's like, hey, here's what we're paying. Like, we're not going to BS you and drag you through details on this. Um, there's also more to a job than just that. It, the culture, the responsibility, the chance to learn, um, push yourself, grow, that all matters. But money matters too. Um, what do you think about Meltronics? No firsthand experience. I don't think they're bad machines, but but don't know much. Um 
Intamin asks, buying a used bigger machine instead of buying a Tormach. Uh, we have a video on that. Take a look at it, Google it. Um, shortest answer, buying a Tormach, easy to work on, easy to fix. Um, it's gonna be new, it's gonna have a warranty. You're gonna be able to make parts. If you know how to buy a used bigger machine, uh, rock and roll, but boy, um, you can end up with $3,000, $10,000 repair bills pretty quick. And if it's a bigger machine that you're gonna have to rig in with riggers and forklifts, I think you were the fellow just asking about space in their parents' garage. Um, that's gonna be tough. A uh, couple more questions, I can't resist. Michael, have you used Daytron end mills and machines other than the Neo? They are, um, are, they are superb, they are very expensive, but uh, Vince has been doing a lot of testing with them and he, even the expensive one, he's like, oh my gosh, it's expensive, but I love it. So uh, they're really good. Um, thanks for all the kind words. What do you think about Willowman now that Grimsmo has one? Cody, sit tight on that. I'm, I'm, I'm chewing. I'm chewing. I love them though. Um, what was the reason for choosing Akuma? Uh, we'll talk more about this in a dedicated video, but we needed a uh, we needed a bridge mill. I think the Genos is one of the best large format uh, bridge mill three axis machines out there. And we looked at DMG. We looked at Toyota. Seriously, we looked at those two. We looked at some other stuff. Um, we're keeping our VF sixes. This is just a little bit of a different kinematic design for what we need now. Alan says, challenge me to open my books, my superior supplier, um, get blanket order pricing. Okay, we'll take a look at it. Um, and finally, wrapping up, um, Savage Fabrication says, been a sole proprietor for six years, two years ago, create a product that has increased our revenue. Good for you. Recently offers a position at another business. Um, we sell that to a salary. Uh, what I should make. Sorry, Savage. Feel free to email me. I'll take, I'm happy to follow up with this offline. Um, I want to wrap up, though, at this point. Um, folks, thank you. I, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I love that I get to do what I've done. We've had a great year. We've had some really good growth. Um, I hope this stuff can help you um, both see some of the successes. But look, I don't have all the answers. And sometimes you want to um, hear how other people are doing it. I hope this is a little bit of an insight into that. Uh, mental state as well as the true business state and machining operations and all that good stuff. Uh, but as always, folks, take care. Thanks for watching. See you soon.